Good morning friends and welcome back to NPTEL online certification course on Indian poetry in English. You remember well uh, that presently we are dealing with ethnographic voices in Indian poetry in English and in the last lecture we had talked about Mamang Dai. In this lecture we are going to undertake two more poets namely Temsula Ao and Istharin Kir under the caption of ethnographic voices. Friends, you remember well that ethnographic voices are those voices which actually talk about a particular reason, a particular race because the word ethnos is a Greek one which actually means race and that is why the poets who have got ethnographic voices they talk more about their own land, their own culture, their own identity and of course their own landscape. If you remember well while talking about the poetic over of Mamang Dai, we had already touched upon uh, these uh, things but in this lecture we are going to take up two voices because the voices of these people in some way or the other have got a sort of parallelism and in this regard it is very difficult to say who is uh, uh, lesser ethnographic and who is more and that is why I thought I should have a combined talk on these two poets. Now before uh, we go uh, to discuss uh, these poets because I do not think it is uh, mandatory to talk more about ethnographic voices as we have already talked about uh, in the previous lecture but straight away we will come to Temsula Ao. Now it is actually quite ironical that these two people I mean Temsula Ao and Istarin Kir though they are still writing but they have not yet attracted the attention of Indian critiques the way other poets have been discussed with. Many of the anthologies especially uh, the major or the representative anthologies have not included uh, these poets. Of course, there are stray papers uh, by research scholars and faculty members on these uh, two poets. So, we shall frame our discussion on the basis of uh, some of their poems uh, because uh, there is a sort of commonality uh, between these two poets. Now, who was Temsula Ao? Temsula Ao was born in the year 1945 in Jorhat in Assam. She actually had her education and then she also got a chance uh, to uh, visit University of Minnesota as a Fulbright Fellow. Temsula Ao is a poet, novelist, short story writer and ethnographer. Majority of us know these uh, two names more uh, as a novelist than as a poet. But the poetry that they have carved out also very significant and that is why I thought of uh, taking up these two voices under the caption ethnographic voices. Temsula Ao retired as a professor from Nehu, fine. Uh, she has actually also uh, been the director of North East Journal Cultural Center. She was honored uh, with the Padma Sri in 2007 and in 2013 she was uh, awarded Sahit Academy Award. Majority of his works have been translated into Oriya, Bengali, Kannad and German. Now as I mentioned earlier, uh, Temsula Ao has a lot to her credit. Uh, she has got uh, more poetry collections uh, than uh, Istarin Kir uh, and uh, both these poets belong to the same reason, fine. So her poetry collections include Songs That Tell which came out in the year 1988. 
Uh, in Temsula's uh, world, you will find that there is a multiplicity of voices apart from uh, the voices of uh, nature, apart from the voices of uh, mountains, hills, uh, as we have also talked about uh, the same thing in uh, the lecture on Mamangdai. Then there came in 1992 songs that try to say songs of many moods, songs from here and there, songs from the other life and book of so songs in 2013. As we have been saying that uh, uh, Temsula Ao also has uh, to her credit uh, some short story collections which also became very famous. These hills called home, it came out in the year 2006. Uh, this is stories from a war zone and then came a uh, labernum for my head in 2009. Uh, there is also a, a memoir fine. Once upon a time uh, in 2013 which is actually uh, uh, one, one of uh, a very significant work of uh, Temsula Ao and then two other voices uh, which actually depict uh, ethnography uh, namely the Ao Naga oral tradition the tombstone in my garden which actually is in the press and maybe any moment of time uh, this can be released. So, this may this this book is uh, going to come uh, this year only the tombstone in my garden. This is again a book of stories. Now, uh, one might wonder as to how Temsula Ao who is uh, actually living in the hills and had her childhood in the hills, how she uh, made a lot of contribution to Indian English literature. And what are actually the themes of her poetry because she began uh, writing as a poet and we find uh, that uh, tem both Temsula Ao and uh, Istarin Kir they belong to a uh, Naga uh, community and uh, while Temsula Ao belongs to Ao community, Ao Naga fine and uh, these two have certain differences uh, but both these uh, poets actually want to delineate in their works uh, the myth fine, the myth of their own area. Uh, there is often a class of cultural values. Majority of the works of uh, Nagaland are actually in the form of uh, oral tradition and that is why in majority of the poets we find memory being unfolded fine. Uh, because of uh, uh, several disturbances and chaos uh, in uh, Nagaland, uh, we find uh, that there is uh, actually a politics of place are found in majority of the works of these two poets. Of course, the nature is at the backdrop, but uh, with nature or under the guise of nature, these poets actually try to convey uh, different sorts of their ideas. Uh, the way natural grandeur or the natural splendor is being demolished uh, because of uh, the fast pace of technology, industrialization and other developmental projects. The poets are actually uh, very much shuddered and they ruefully have delineated uh, the theme uh, uh, like this in majority of their poems. Many of uh, them have also felt dislocation to be one common theme because of the unwanted change and transformation and of course, since uh, uh, mm, uh, these tribals they do not have uh, uh, too much of uh, you know written records that is why Temsula Ao as well as Istarin Kir they actually got the chance uh, to bring to all these stories and experiences in the form of their works of art. So we can take some of the lines from uh, one of her poems My Hills where she says, but today I no longer know my hills, the bird song is gone replaced by the scatto of sophisticated weaponry. So, see here refers to uh, the, the sort of chaos uh, that uh, was prevalent uh, in her state fine. Uh, Temsula Ao's views uh, because Temsula Ao not only writes about hills, but then with hills she identifies her uh, uh, own uh, recognition, so her own culture and the tradition of Northeast India. So, what she says is uh, very uh, significant and uh, pertinent. The cultures of North East are already facing tremendous challenges and these challenges actually uh, form uh, the backdrop of many of the themes of her poetry as well as her stories. From education and modernization in the evolution of such cultures and the identities that they embody, the loss of distinctive identity does not bode well for the tribes of the region. That is why we say ethnographic voices they feel that their identity is being endangered, it is being threatened. If the trend is allowed to continue, 
in an indiscriminate and mindless manner, globalization will create a market in which Naga, Khasi or Mijo communities will become mere brand names and commodity markers stripped of all human significance and which will definitely mutate the ethnic and symbolic identities of a proud people. Now, these uh, poets, they are very much worried about their own identity, their own land, their own culture. And they say uh, that with the advance of technology and with the advance of industrialization, fine, uh, the, their own identity, their indigenous identity is at stake. And that is why uh, these uh, voices actually experience a danger to the ethnic and symbolic identities of a proud people. Now, uh, let us take some of the poems of uh, Temsula Au first and uh, uh, we shall see because through their poems, they actually try to convey their ideas, uh, their sense of belonging which they feel at times, which they feel at times are being threatened. So, this is a, a poem entitled The Old Storyteller, a Naga Land Poem. She calls it a Naga Land Poem. Now, uh, the way she uh, mentions or depicts, she composes her lines, you will find that there is a natural uh, push, there is a natural flow, uh, maybe it is not rhythmic, but it looks as if it were telling its own story. I have lived my life believing storytelling was my proud legacy. It is said that these uh, Nagas believed in storytelling. We have already talked about in the previous lecture that how animism was a part of their faith. We have also mentioned deep ecology where we have said uh, that both man and animals and nature, they can live in communion with each other. And uh, since they do not have any recorded history or recorded story, they believed in oral tradition and that is why they say storytelling was my proud legacy, the ones I inherited from grandfather became my primary treasure and the ones I garnered from other chroniclers added to the lore. When my time came, I told stories. So, the continuation of a tradition. As though they ran in my blood, because each telling revitalized my life force and each story reinforced my racial reminiscence. My racial reminiscence, the stories told of the moment when we broke into being from the six stones, how the first fathers founded. So, there is a myth and in this myth, we shall also discuss later on that they believed in six stones and out of these six stones, three stones were of males and three of females and they believed in the continuation of the tradition. Our ancient villages and worship the forces of nature, the northeast people and especially uh, the uh, tribal people, they found themselves very close to nature and they worshipped uh, nature like anything. Uh, they believe that uh, nature also has a life of their own. And then warriors and war tigers came alive through the tales as did the various animals who were once our brothers until we invented human language. We were. So, in a, in a way, they also take uh, uh, a dig because uh, on, uh, on many occasions they have been actually treated like animals and they say because we until we invented human language, we did not have our own language and that is why uh, we can find in several stories and poems that they bear a sort of resemblance, they bear a sort of parallelism uh, with the animals. They also have got, I mean these people have got a sort of familiarity with them and they find that in them uh, lies their spirit as well and began calling them savage. Grandfather constantly warned that forgetting the stories would be catastrophic. So, now you see uh, the danger that they feel and from one generation to another because storytelling was a sort of practice that was going on, we would lose our history territory and most certainly our intrinsic identity. So, I told stories as my racial responsibility to instill in the young the art of perpetuating existential history and essential tradition to be passed on to the next generation because we do not have any written history, we do not have any written legacy and this storytelling, this oral tradition is our legacy. But now, 
a new era has dawned insidiously displacing the old. So, with the arrival of the new era all our storytelling act is actually being relegated. My own grandsons dismiss our stories as ancient gibberish. The time you know with time uh, comes the change and the poet says my own grandsons dismiss our stories as ancient gibberish from the dark ages outmoded in the present times and ask who needs rambling stories, who are the listeners to the stories. When books will do just fine, the rejection from my own has stemmed the flow. The rejection from my own has stemmed the flow and the stories seem to regress into an unreachable recesses of mind, of a mind once vibrant with stories now reduced to unimaginable stillness. So, when memory fails and words falter, I am overcome by a bestial craving to wrench the thieving guts out of that original dog and consign all my stories to the script in his ancient entrails. So, the poet is actually very much unnerved at the loss of a tradition that actually was a legacy of theirs. And even the coming generations, they also dismiss uh, this practice of oral traditions and say that in an age of books, who will uh, listen to your stories? And but then the loss of the story is a loss of the culture. It is actually a loss of their tradition. It is a loss of their legacy that they had inherited from their forefathers. If we have a serious look and critically appreciate the poem, we will find that it is actually about the continuation of the tradition of Aonaga community. There are two uh, communities, Aonaga communities and then Angami community and then there can be many more the way you go into their historical details. So, this legacy should be continued from one generation to another that is what actually the poet wishes for. And then uh, the six stones reference that I had mentioned. So, they are regarded as the sources of the origin of Aonaga community and one can also find uh, the conflict between tradition and modernity fine, the conflict between tradition and the industrialization and of course, at the same time there were several things being done in their land which the common people were being a victim of. So, the glorification of the past because in the loss of their legacy, in the loss of the oral tradition, they feel uh, that uh, their past is being relegated and that is why the poet wants actually to glorify the past and there is uh, an immediate search for the loss that they are going to face. Now, the question is uh, should in an age where we are looking for globalization and all, should we really relegate the oral tradition of a particular race of a particular community? My dear friends, if something is very important to somebody that is one's culture and the loss of the culture that has not been our tradition. We actually should try our level best to recover, to regain the cultural loss that we have faced because every culture has got a sort of distinct identity. Uh, Temsula Ao uh, wrote uh, many stone poems. Now, why they wrote stone poems? Because most of the time they were surrounded by mountains, hills, rivers, stones and all and these stone poems as I have been saying that they are inspired by the myth of Ao Naga's origin from six stones. Out of these six stones, uh, three represent male while remaining three represent female. Uh, Temsula Ao delineates the landscape which is actually in harmony with nature. If you read uh, the poems of Temsula Ao, you can find that how an effort has been made not only to delineate the land and its beauty, but at the same time to continue the tradition which once upon a time was a sort of legacy which they got from their forefathers. Industrialization and development of several projects have actually uh, destroyed their natural bond of our community. Ao Naga believed that they were having a sort of communion with nature and that is why when a new project comes, 
a development project comes and if uh, that poses a danger to it, in a way they feel that their culture actually receives a sort of impending danger. They also find uh, that they are being you know deprived of their roots in terms of their ethnic values. There are some stone poems namely stone poem from Langar Tok. Langar Tok is a place in Nagaland fine. Then illusion prayer of a monolith when a stone wept. Now see these poets also try to find tongue in brooks, tongue in mountains and let us take some lines from one very famous poem entitled illusion where the poet says then the road builders came and slapped sticks of dynamite to his underbelly. Fine. So, in a way they feel that all these developmental projects are not in conformity with the identity of the our communities because they feel that it is actually a menace. It is actually a menace to their mythical identity, to their racial identity. Let us take one poem and see the sort of emotions that the poet generates and the poet actually feels. The poem is titled From When a Stone Wept. The umb of the young, the umb of the young earth nestling beneath the huge stones heaved, dislodging their foundations of expelling her secrets through the phenomenal birth. So, giving you know human attribute to the stone. After the great upheaval, the stones stirred. This upheaval may be in different ways, fine. When the projects come and they, they, they actually are try are to break these mountains or hills with the help of the dynamics just for a development. But then these people feel anxious to establish permanent moorings in a landscape they knew would soon be dominated by the new species. They actually feel the people of these communities, they feel uh, that with the development, new people will come, new species will come and that will actually prove dangerous to their ethnic identity. As they dispersed east, west, north and south, one among them irresolute about their route rolled herself down a hill resolving to lay her claim on a mossy bank nearby. So, many people opposed fine where the west bound stone stopped to propose that she join him on his quest. She politely refused and being weary slipped into heedless carefree sleep. In the morning she found him gone but strangely felt his presence as if a deep imprint was left somewhere in her deepest self. So, here uh, the poet actually talks about the life that even the mountains and the hills can also have and how they feel intimidated, how they feel threatened. We can take some more lines. Turning it into a graveyard of the earth by all these actions it appears as if the entire land will become a graveyard of the earth, where an abandoned stone mother and her disowned children still conspire to create a shroud of stones. So, since stone is associated with the myth, uh, with the culture, with their cultural belief. So, these people feel that by destroying it, by breaking it, perhaps the mythical tradition is going to be broken and then the earth will become a sort of graveyard and abandoned stone mother because you know we have already said that uh, three of these stones uh, represented a uh, female and the other three represented males. So, the mother stone and her disowned children still conspire to create a shroud of stones. We actually find that through these poems, the poet actually expresses the common people's demand for a territory which will lead them to relocate their lost identity. And that is why they feel uh, that such projects are inimical, fine. So, the delineation of myth has become a site to reclaim the forgotten past, the forgotten uh, past my dear friend, it is actually a past, forgotten past. This myth is a part of collective memory of our Naga community. 
it is actually a part of their collective consciousness fine and preservation of place and natural surrounding around her. So, when uh, um, uh, Temsula Ao uh, composed uh, another book of poems uh, you know in the in the preface what she writes to all who can still sense the earth touch the wind talk to the rain and embrace the sun in every rainbow. This is what uh, she uh, writes in the preface uh, of one of her books. So, sense the earth meaning thereby when we are going to bring development projects and all perhaps we are unable to understand that these mountains and the hills also have got a life of their own. Perhaps we are not able to understand the language of the wind, we are not able to talk to the rain and my dear friends in a way as we see man's actions in a way it appears as if we are exploiting nature and then finally we are trying once again to go back and there are different ways uh, through which we want to bring once again we want to create nature is that possible. Human limitations no can come to a close, but the natural glories that we are going to lose we cannot recover them and that is why today we have less rains, we have loss of water, we talk about ecological imbalance. So, in a way when we look at these poems and these poets very seriously we find that their closeness or their proximity with nature was not devoid of a philosophic uh, significance, a philosophic message. Now, there is one a very significant collection by uh, Temsula Ao entitled Songs from the Other Life and the one that I was uh, telling you before the uh, about the preface where she says to all who can still sense the earth. The book was dedicated to all who can sense the earth, touch the wind, talk to the rain and embrace the sun in every rainbow. Now, in this in this uh, poem uh, we will rather find fine there are uh, more than uh, I mean around 16 poems and majority of the poems they talk about the life, culture and many more. We can take some of the poems. Uh, it is actually believed there is a poem entitled A Tiger Woman's Prayer where uh, the poet uh, uh, tells us uh, that in uh, Naga Ao community some men and women are believed to have some amount of familiarity and they actually bear a resemblance to the spirit of tiger and other animals. And this they say they actually had this power, they had this power, but these powers are now eroding, these powers are now decreased, these powers are now deteriorating. And then uh, the poem is a longer one, but I have taken some of the lines where uh, the poet says, and entangled my woman self in an unseemly mesh of a spirit, human and beast. So, I implore grant me this last prayer. So, that when I cross over to the reason beyond the sun like all others of my kind, the iridescent fumes of the last sunset will dissolve my natural selves be they spirit, woman or tiger and rage a rainbow there against our composite tears. So, uh, the poet apprehends that with all these things there will be a loss, but then it will actually be a loss of the spirit, loss of the tiger spirit that even many men and women have and that is why she says before, before they actually lose it fine, before they lose it they actually go for a prayer. So, that when I cross over to the reason beyond the sun like all others of my kind the iridescent fumes of the last sunset because that is not going to be recovered now. Again uh, there is another poem that I am very much tempted to take and uh, this poem is entitled the leaf shredder. In this poem we find uh, that many of these uh, people uh, Naga Ao community people they actually had the power to predict the power to predict, they used to foretell future 
and uh, because they have been listening to stories and through their stories only because the stories were uh, the only way of entertainment. But then the sort of mythical parts, the sort of uh, divine parts that many of them had and one such uh, lady is being described here where many people used to go to know about their future and this in this poem the leaf shredder it is said a uh, shredder it is said that there used to be one ara sent sur ara sent sur it is actually the word for soothsayer for soothsayer and this um, ara sent sur had actually uh, the uh, boon or the merit that such a person could tell you something more about future they could leak, look in look into the seeds of time how by shredding a leaf by shredding a leaf and this was called arm a a m arm fine he calls me barren and says i am a curse this is actually about a lady who goes to such an ara sent sur such a soothsayer and she narrates her own problems and she also gets the remedy and the poem goes like this he calls me barren and says i am a curse on his clan and demands a son by next harvest or he will take another woman who will hold his seed and give his sons. Now, through this poem, not only does the poet actually talks about how they had got some superpowers, but in a way, he also says that even in their community also, there used to pe be people who were, who believed in having actually a clan of sons. I mean, the patriarchal order. And then this suits here. The old woman still remembers how the frightened eyes concentrated on the leaves she shredded to determine the mystery of the young wife's despair. So, this young lady who had gone to this soothsayer and was trying to know about her own future because she was being, she was going to be deserted by her husband. And the soothsayer says, when she finished divining, she looked at the hopeful wife and whispered, go home my child, you will bear many sons. So, this is what the soothsayer says and she chuckles now in recalling and this lady, this lady who is a soothsayer, she actually uh, recalls her own days when how she had foretold uh, that that particular lady will have so many sons. The part she left unsaid and how the woman bore many sons but for another man. The woman bore many sons, but for another man. Now, the question is what the poet actually tries to say is that the fault does not lie only in the woman alone. The fault may also be with the man. Fine. So, the question is not only through the stories, not only through the prediction, but through this, the poet also tries to take a dig at the patriarchal order that is prevalent even among her own community. Uh, now, as I have been talking about the myth and the cultural values of the Naga Ao uh, community, there is another poem named Soul Bird. And uh, in this poem, uh, the poet actually talks about uh, a death, how a death takes place, how somebody is dead, but then there is actually a belief among these Naga Ao community that so long as when we die, our soul actually flees, our soul flees and then uh, unless and until a bird is found flapping its wings in the sky, fine. So, they do not believe that the soul has finally gone to its own place and the poem's lines go like this. She slowly turns heavenwards as her red rimmed eyes settle on the circling and silote. Then with a sudden unseemly hoop, she draws me closer whispering in my ear. Somebody who had lost her dear and near once uh, was actually waiting unless and until the hawk will appear in the sky, perhaps the soul will not have uh, a, a, a sort of perfection. And that is why the other lady says, see that keening bird in the sky, that is your mother's soul, saying her final goodbye, it is over, come, let us go home now. So, such a belief persisted among this Aonaga community and that is why the poem has been titled Soul Bird. Dear friends, uh, Temsula Ao did not write only about the myth, myth uh, and the culture and all, but she also believed 
are that women of that community wanted to marry not those people who actually were very ambitious, but those people who had actually got some love for their counterpart. And this poem entitled Woman to Man. Now, how a woman tells a man when a woman's question is being popped, the father looks for a pertinent candidate uh, to be uh, the groom for her daughter, but the daughter says, because the daughter is very ethnographic, the daughter is very close to her own race, and she says, she tells her mother, no, perhaps you do not know what is my preference. In your arju, in your arju, I hear you are the best storyteller. This is about a man. She tells a man that in your Arju, Arju is uh, the word for them which actually means dormitory and she says, you, I may not be very beautiful, but why I want to uh, be wed by you is because in your dormitory, you are supposed to be the best storyteller. So, when your maternal uncle comes, I shall tell my mother to tell my father that his daughter prefers the house of bamboo and thatch. I do not need any, you know, hi-fi uh, building where I can not get love, but I simply, because till now I have lived in a house of bamboo and thatch. So, that is very close to me, how I am bound to nature and the house of bamboo and thatch where the bonfires of our hearts will seem the flame of the hearth. What I actually need is my own land, my own tradition, my own culture, a man who can bring me all sorts of satisfaction and in whom hearts there can be a bonfire of love. In that house, I shall place my precious loom and what I want to do there? I will be very much satisfied simply to bring a loom and I shall be wearing you a langtam every season and a sunak at every motsu. A langtam is a loin cloth and now again very close to I will bring fine, I will spin a langtam every season for you and a sunak and a sunak. Sunak is a traditional sol, fine, at every moetsu, at every spring festival. So, the question is that even through her own poems, she tries to say that these people are very close to their own tradition and to their own culture. They do not want, uh, fine, as uh, any ambitious people to go to high rise buildings and to a very prosperous one, but, a wa but they want to be wed only to a man who could fulfill their desires and who could uh, satisfy them even being in a bamboo house and a thatched house. My dear friends, we have seen uh, that Temsula Ao was very close to nature and in her poems we have found how not only does she reuse uh, the loss of nature uh, because of the exploitation of man uh, because of uh, their crass commercial desires. But then the other poet that I have intended to take is Istharin Kir. As I had already told you in the beginning that both these poets bear a close resemblance. So, let us also take some of the poems uh, since these poets have not been included in many more anthologies other than the Northeast anthologies and all. So, I have found some poems from here and there and have tried to formulate my lecture. Now, Istharin Kir was born in 1959 to Angami Naga. You remember? Uh, Temsula Ao was to Ao Naga and uh, Istarin Kir was to Angami Naga family in Kohima, Nagaland, India. Kir is a poet, novelist, translator and short story writer. Uh, she is interested in performing jazz poetry. Of course, her poetry collections are too less because she is more known for story writing and for her fiction. Uh, she also writes children's books and of course, because of uh, the problems at uh, in her home state, uh, she has now switched over to uh, Norway and there she leaves. She was actually conferred with many prizes, uh, one of the most uh, famous being Sahitya Garbi prize in 2018. What Kir says about uh, the oral Naga tradition is, I felt we needed to create written Naga literature. We have so much oral narratives, but with oral dying out, it is all going to be lost since we do not have a written history and that is why 
uh, both Temsula Ao and Isterin Kir, they decided to bring that oral tradition in the form of writing and that is why they have taken up writing poems, short stories and of course novels. So her literary corpus uh, includes some poetry collections. The very one that is actually a uh, very famous entitled Kel Hao Kebira came out in 1982. Uh, it is considered to be the first book of poetry in English by a Naga poet. This, this book came out in 1982. And then in 2012 came her uh, jazz poetry and other poems and she has also translated more than 200 oral poems of her homeland into English. Uh, some of her non-fiction works are also very important namely walking the road, lash the road, exploring the tribes of Nagaland about the history and lifestyle of Naga people. Uh, then in fiction a Naga village remembered which came out in 2003. It was actually a first novel in English by any Naga writer. Then came A Terrible Matriarchy in 2007. Then came Mari, A Bitter Womanhood, When the River Sleeps, Don't Run, My Love. So, these are some of her uh, novels and as a novelist she is more popular uh, than as a, a poet. But then since we are discussing uh, uh, Istan Kir as a poet, we shall take up her poetry collection Kel Hao Kevira which came out in the year 1982. This actually this uh, that uh, title of this book is from the Angami dialect which actually means life in a better place or paradise. Now, what does it indicate? It indicates that the life that she was living, Istarin Kir was living was a life she was not satisfied with my difference. Fine? She was not satisfied with the life that she was living. Uh, there was in her home state a conflict which actually resulted in great displacement and unrest in uh, Naga uh, Rizin. Fine? And uh, this uh, collection Kel Hao Kevira, it actually is a sort of mourning it mourns the loss of the warriors of Nagaland who lost their lives in Indo-Naga conflict of the 1950s. Many youths had actually taken to uh, arms, taken to fight for the state which caused uh, lots of violence and unrest in the area. Uh, they they uh, found that their own culture uh, was being intimidated and they wanted a space for their own. Uh, the poet uh, Esther in Kir also shows great cultural tradition of Nagaland uh, through her writings and uh, the cultural heritage of Nagaland we can uh, find that it was destroyed because of many unfortunate events which took place uh, in this uh, uh, state. Many Naga people not only lost their lives but many of them got displaced, some of them actually changed their locations fine. Uh, in, in one of the poems, uh, some lines which actually are very pathetic, how many men, how many women, how many children they have killed for crying out freedom. So, in a way the poet also uh, talks about those people who are fighting for their own rights of saving their own uh, culture, saving their own identity, I cannot recall. This is from a poem after reading Wounded Knee. The such a sort of chaos and unrest led to many unwanted habits like alcoholism, fine, corruption. Uh, the poet actually longs for peace. The poet yearns for peace and justice after elaborating the grand scale of violence which actually uh, took place in this land. We can uh, take some lines from Kel Hao Kevira as I said. Uh, that her poetry collections are less in number. But then uh, through this collection and if we take some of the lines we can find out how the poet's heart goes out to these warriors. They brought in their dead, they brought in their dead by night, their proud warriors, fine. Their mighty warriors, the brave beloved of the gods to rest under troubled skies and battle scarred lands that some portion of a vanquished field may forever remain Nagaland, forever Nagaland. So, a cry for their own homeland. The golden fields, they lay unripped, they are very close to nature and they say that these warriors will not return and who will actually reap 
are these golden fields as blood freely flowed and mingled with the rains and stained the virgin soil like a thousand scarlet sunsets black of the blue blue hills so the blue hills suddenly got red because of the disturbance because of the chaos their hearts too grieved to heed the harvest maiden ceased song so their natural ability of singing came to a halt and mourned the brave ones and blindly followed a broken people who turned their backs and slowly walked away from a burning village a burning village and there were some in foreign lands displacement and there were some in foreign lands who still spoke of kelhau kevira the better place so they call their own land the better place a paradise who does not love one's own home who does not love one's own state while her fields lay barren and desecrated her song sacrificed to the wind her warriors to the great spirit they trampled her silent hills fine and squeezed the life out of her and washed their guilt in her blood so the the land uh, finally the land became a bloody land and instead of the harvest what could be seen there was only cry only tears and all so the poet expresses her own pathos uh, with the people with the warrior who actually would not return because they have returned with their dead bodies there's another poem uh, named uh, narcissus uh, i think uh, all of you uh, know that uh, narcissus actually was a hunter uh, who did not have any love and who only loved himself and uh, till he died he was much in love with himself and after his death there sprouted a flower which was named uh, narcissus so this poem let us have a look at the lines of this poem last night the shadow chased me and the winter moon screamed in my ears ah calcutta i could not sleep i watched your silent city weave a tapestry of poems songs dead roses and a pair of deep brown eyes i saw a thousand gypsy summers we are reminded of william wordsworth fine like the thousand daffodils no right down midnight avenue i traveled national highway 37 and spoke to the wild geese at down i heard the paddy birds in the rice fields singing ave maria and when the thorn bird brought me back you did not hear my goodbye farewell virgo i leave you part of my evening song and the dreams autumn borrowed last year take care of your solipsism and give my love to delen on the 1230 he will be wearing an arabian night so if we analyze this poem also critically we find that there is a conflict between nature and the urban life the city life uh, there is also a uh, found a sort of uh, lack of communication between two lovers or two human beings Mm, of course the poet has uh, made uh, uh, a use of abundant use of simile metaphor personification and hyperbole but then there is also a mythical reference to arabian night which is symbolic of the male ego or the patriarchal ego uh, the poem can also be understood and interpreted as a conflict between illusion and reality uh, now when we talk about uh, the tradition of the northeast and especially of uh, the oral tradition of nagaland what istri istrin kir uh, wrote in uh, um, the famous uh, barcelona dream time is actually very significant where she says every man is a story every story has something in common with the stories of the rest of humanity and yet each story is different from the others in every story that we tell we validate lives when we share the stories of our people we add meaning to their action the choices they make and the values they live by the need to tell one's story is a common need in a way the poet actually tries to unfold and say that every story that we say has got some relation with other stories and every man is a story meaning thereby it is actually a memory it is a history and in every story that we tell we are perhaps validating we are perhaps glorifying and when we share the stories of other people even then we are actually trying to add meaning to it 
if we have a look at what is Trin Keir had her views on Naga culture, what she says is, I maintain that Nagas are my first audience because they write things that are familiar to them. We have shared memories, shared story banks from the past, both from the natural world and the spiritual world. Here they try to bring a sort of connection between what uh, the uh, Naga people believe and how their reverence for nature also sustains. Uh, for her uh, your belief on uh, Naga movement, we can also uh, find out, my people and I have been living with an invisible prison for many years, denied freedom of expression. That, that is what every movement in a way talks about. They actually want to have something of their own. Freedom to nationhood and most painfully freedom to life itself that somebody who does not have or who cannot have a claim for uh, their own land, their own identity, their own culture, perhaps they are not free despite the fact that we are living in an air of freedom, in an age of freedom. Very sadly, a cause that started so nobly was destroyed from within by factionalism. Here she actually refers to how there were certain groups, how there were certain splits while they were demanding for their own land, why they are thinking of their own culture. And it suffered the erosion of unity that factionalism always brings. We started well, no doubt about that, but we are not finishing well. That is what makes our story so sad. Disunity and the struggle for power has diminished the aspects that made the struggle noble and worthy. So, once we do not have a common goal, once we do not have a collective goal, perhaps we are not going to succeed, whether it is for our identity, for our culture, for our own belief, for our own system. So, when uh, we have discussed both these poets, we find that there are certain commonalities uh, between the two, but when we discuss them separately, we find that while Temsula Ao has got multiplicity of voices, uh, Isterin Kir believes more in myth, more in uh, her people being very close to nature. So, Kir's works are the reflection of the conflict between colonial regime versus native people. Fine. She is of course the leading voice who actually tries to delineate the vibrant tradition and culture of Nagaland. Fine, there is a mention of cultural mutation, a cultural friction and the sufferings of Naga people. So, one can always say uh, that Isterin Kir's uh, works are more of Naga consciousness and that is also at the core of her writing. Naga folk culture, which is actually day by day uh, eroding its own values, uh, are being are being uh, discovered to be brought into the limelight through the writings of these people. They are actually uh, also delineating the resistance against the silencing of the native voice, the native ethos the depiction of violence, unrest and disturbance in her homeland, uh, in their homeland rather have really uh, caused havoc and that actually becomes a part of their writing. One can also find a concern over women's respectability and reputation. We have already uh, uh, taken one poem where we see how a woman wants her own voice and how she says that she would like to love and she would like to live in a bamboo and thatch house and she would like to uh, place her own loom so that she can weave the dreams of her own man. There is of course a sort of eco-consciousness in the majority of the works that Esther and Kir has carved out. It is actually time uh, because you know we are always running short of time and I uh, took these uh, two poets together because there were lots of uh, common things in and between. But before we end, let us take some beautiful lines from both the poets as we have been uh, doing. First from Temsula Au's uh, poem, Mirror, Mirror. Now see, uh, this poet has multiplicity of voices as I say, where she says, I look into the mirror and see a face which now parodies the one that I once knew. So, there is actually a beautiful play uh, between past and present and she says that age can also have its own imprint even upon our body, even upon our face. To counter lost landscape and degenerated visages is this compensation and my only consolation. So, see while she talks about her own progress and her own deterioration, but then in her mind is the deterioration of her own identity of her own land. We can also take uh, some lines uh, from uh, you know Esther in Kir's poem after reading Undead Knee where she says, we were proud and we were true, a race of men like you. 
So why are we facing this discrimination? We too were once free, children of those spaces of a sky and mountain range and rock bound river bequeathed us by the great spirit of these hills. Our hills had a spirit of its own. The white man came and then the brown man came after fifth and 50 years it has been now that they have been telling us we are not our own. Fine. So she talks about colonialism. She also talks about splits in and between and then she says that even after 50 years where are we? Where is our tradition? Where is our history? Where is our identity? Where is our language? Where is our culture? Ultimately we are still suffering a sort of loss and we try to regain. Uh, we try to overcome that loss. We try to recover that culture and in the recovery of the culture alone can be our triumph alone can be our nativity songs. So my dear friends, we have seen that both these poets have talked about their own culture, tradition, nativity songs and many more. And uh, there is a conflict between nature and man and we find that how man has exploited nature for their own benefits. But one should always try to preserve one's own culture, one's own identity, one's own language. And with this, we come to the end of today's talk. I think this will ignite you to more and more readings of the poems of these two celebrated poets who are actually vying for a space in the poetic world of Indian poetry in English. Thank you very much. I wish you all a good day.